gather, grow, give, go. Gather, grow, give, go. Gather, grow, give, go. Gather, grow, give, go. We are kingdom fellowship. We're kingdom focused.
Welcome to Tuesday Night Bible Study. My name is Dr. Mark Martin, and I'm honored to lead us through God's Word tonight. I do want to take a moment to thank God for Pastor Watley and his family and all that they do in serving the kingdom of God. Let's continue to keep them lifted up in prayer. If this is your first time joining us, welcome. We're so excited to have you. We invite you to connect with us. We also have the opportunity this evening to worship God through giving. And all the different methods of giving are on your screen. But let's take advantage of giving back to God a portion of that of which he's given to us. So tonight, my friends, I want to talk to us about communicating the case for Christ. Now, I must confess, I'm an apologetics nerd. I enjoy so much debating and reviewing and studying the scriptures. In particular, I really enjoy defending our faith, defending the faith. And we're going to get into a little bit of that uh, through this teaching. Our foundational scripture tonight can be found in Matthew chapter 8, 28, sorry, verses 16 through 20. The NIV reads like this. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely, I am with you always to the very end of the age. Now, my friends, the background or context for that scripture is that Jesus is resurrected and meets with his disciples to show himself. Now, I can imagine uh, the shock and awe of Jesus presenting himself to the disciples. As the text points out, some are worshipful and some are doubting. I imagine they probably didn't know what to do, but Jesus communicates his instructions to them. In his communication, he declares that he will be with them always to the very end of the age. Now let's get that. He declares that he will be with them always to the very end of the age. Jesus, son of the father, one member of the Holy Trinity, is declaring that he will be with them always to the very end of the age. That's a tremendous promise and a promise that is ironclad. And I praise God for it. It may have felt like nothing, but in his word and deed, Jesus was communicating the gospel to his disciples. If we were to define communication, it would sound something like this. The act or process of using words, sounds, signs, or behaviors to express or exchange information or to express your ideas, thoughts, and feelings. Communication is subject to the 73855 rule. That states only 7% of all communication is done through verbal communication, whereas the nonverbal component of our daily communication such as the tonality of our voice and the body language, make up 38% and 55% respectively. Why does that matter? Well, according to the 73855 rule, only 7% of all communication is done through verbal communication. We tend to think that communication is primarily predicated on verbal communication on the words we speak. We think everything is about what we say, but there is more. I'll give you an example. Not too long ago, I received an email from a coworker and they were pointing out something uh, that we needed to look at. And um, as I read the email, I felt like it was combative in its tone. I felt like it was sort of like, Uh, uh, begrudging to say, uh, but combative. 
And so I spoke with my coworker about the business at hand. And, and then I mentioned the tone of the email. And they were so surprised. They communicated to me that they had, that was not their intention at all. Their intention was not to communicate a combative tone. Quite far from it, they were just making a point about the work at hand. So that's how important uh, understanding that our communication is more than just the words we speak. It's about the nonverbal aspects also. Here are some quick and fun facts about communication. The first written communication was in the form of marks and, and symbols recorded more than 9,000 years ago. Ancient Egyptians used symbols called hieroglyphics over 5,200 years ago. They recorded their writings on stone or metal tablets or papyrus, which is a paper made from plant fibers. The written Chinese language contains over 80,000 different symbols, although most people use about only 5,000. Today, there are over 6,000 languages spoken in the world. In Papua New Guinea alone, over 800 languages are spoken, and that's amazing. So just knowing what you know about Jesus, how would you describe him as a communicator? Personally, I describe him as a communicator. I'd say he was effective because he was able to get people to believe he was the son of God and receive salvation. He used communication effectively to accomplish the goal that he set out to achieve. How do we know this? We know this because of testimonies, their testimonies. Testimonies are simply put, testimonies simply put are a story to tell. It is your story. It is what you've been through. And in the Bible, the Bible itself is peppered with testimonies, stories that where people engage with Jesus and then after the engagement with Jesus, have a powerful story, a powerful testimony to tell. Let's look at a few. There's when this, the uh, testimony where Jesus heals the man born blind, found in John chapter 9, verses 1 through 41. Jesus heals the leper. It's found in Matthew chapter 8, verses 1 through 5. Jesus speaks with the woman at the well. That's found in John chapter 4, verses 1 through 26. Jesus also heals a centurion servant. That can be found in Luke chapter 7, verses 1 through 10. Jesus raises the dead. There's a number of examples of this. The widow's son at name, found in Luke chapter 7, verses 11 through 17. There's Jairus' daughter. That's found in Matthew chapter 9, verses 18 through 26. Mark chapter 5, verses 21 through 43. And also found in Luke chapter 8, verses 40 through 56. And of course, there's Lazarus. Lazarus. John chapter 11, verses, uh, verses 1 through 44. These testimonies prove that Jesus was the master communicator. Because Jesus lives within us, he has given us to share our faith with those who do not know Christ. The Holy Spirit is a gift to the believer. He is there to help us as we do kingdom work. He will bring to our remembrance scriptures, stories, testimonies that will aid us as we engage people who do not know Christ, as we witness to them. Every believer has someone that God has placed in their circle of influence that he wants to reach through us. They're not there by accident. They are there because he desires to reach them through you. He didn't save you to be to yourself. He saved you and I so that we might reach those people in our circle of influence. The people in our circle of influence, who are they? They're our coworkers. They're our family. They're our friends. They're our children. They are extended family. It's whoever God has placed in our influence, in and around us, 
Understand that God is not a God that just does stuff by happenstance. He's a strategic God. Everything he does has a purpose that is a part of a larger plan. So even the families that we're born into, the jobs that we're on, the schools that we go to, he is a God that orders our steps. And so it's not by accident that all of these people and places line up for us to reach others. So as we prepare to share our faith with others, there are a few things that we should remember. Number one, understand that your own life is a great part of your witness. People not only listen to our words, they look at our lives also. We still fail and aren't always, good ex- always a good example. So our only hope is to come to God and surrender to him. It's nothing that we can do. It's God's work. That's the good news. Number two, realize that we earn the right to be heard by sincerely listening to others. Everyone has a story. You can't just blunder into a situation and callously share without listening. The Bible says that Jesus was a friend of sinners. That's our example, to be a friend, to listen to people, see where they are, and then take them where they need to go. How many friends do you have in your circle that are non-believers? Or or, or are are all of your friends believers? We should get in the habit of getting to know unbelievers so that we might be able to share the gospel and introduce them to Christ. Number three, recognize that people are looking for a cure. When you go to the doctor, you don't say, I have cancer. Instead, you describe your symptoms. That's where most people live. They only see the symptoms. Symptoms such as, I'm lonely. I'm suffering from a broken relationship. I'm stressed. There's darkness within me that I don't know what to do with. How do we share Christ with someone who is overwhelmed with their symptoms? As believers, we know the ultimate cure. It's Jesus Christ. Jesus didn't die for their symptoms. He died for their sins. Yet people don't wake up in the morning and think, you know, I need to accept Jesus Christ today. They wake up with the symptoms. And so as people who are attempting to rescue those who are lost, We need to start with their symptoms. Show them the disease. What is that disease? It is sin. And take them to the ultimate cure. What is that cure? It's Jesus. Number four, keep it simple. The gospel is already simple. Christ died for our sins. He was buried. He rose again. We need to turn away from the things that are wrong in our lives and accept what Jesus did on the cross for us and receive him as Lord. It's as simple as that. Don't complicate it. So many times we throw in things like our denomination or other doctrines, or we use religious terms that a lot of people just don't understand. We end up confusing them and creating barriers. Let's just explain the gospel in a way that people can understand. Let's just keep it simple. Number five, stress the love of God. John 3.16 says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. It all starts with, with love, my friends, and that's where we need to start. Ultimately, we have to explain that we are all sinners and have violated God's standards. And because of that, there is a judgment. What is that judgment? Romans 6.23 tells us the wages of sin is death. So I want to share a quick story with you about one of my first evangelism experiences. You know, I've been walking through these 
th- this lesson and sharing uh, about the nuances of communication and such. And I remember on one of my first ev- evangelism experiences, it was actually uh, in New York, the summer of uh, 9-11. We were street witnessing in the Bronx. We actually uh, drove from New York, uh, from North Carolina to New York. It was about a 12 hour bus ride. We stayed in New York City in Manhattan at a youth hostel, but we stayed overnight, but during the day, we were witnessing on the streets of the Bronx. Now, if you know anything about the Bronx, uh, it can be rough, but we knew God was with us. In that type of environment, we had to think about how were we going to engage the folks who live and work and move through the Bronx. So we used a technique that is referred to Uh, as the Romans wrote. We use that to walk through God's plan of salvation and invite people to Christ. We engage with them. We got to know them. And then we walk them through God's plan of salvation by using the Romans road. And I want to share that plan with you this evening. So with the Romans road, There are five questions that need to be answered regarding salvation through Christ. Who needs salvation? That's question number one. Number two, why do we need salvation? Number three, how does God provide salvation? Number four, how do we receive salvation? And number five, what are the results of salvation? These are all good key questions that need to be answered because when we engage people and start to talk about God's plan of salvation, it's very likely one or all of these questions will be asked of us. So let's walk through the Romans road. Let's start with question number one. Who needs salvation? Well, that's found in Romans chapter 3, verses 9 through 12 and verse 23. And it reads like this. What shall we conclude then? Do we have any advantage? Not at all. For we have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under the power of sin. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. In verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. My friends, simply put, the playing field is even. We are all sinners in search of of a savior, in need of a savior. Paul lets us know there is no one righteous, not even one. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So to answer the question, who needs salvation? Everyone needs salvation. Second step or second question on the Romans road. Why do we need salvation? The answer can be found in Romans chapter 6, verse 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. My friends, God's law demands death as the punishment for sin. I'm going to say that again. God's law demands death as the punishment for sin. Why do we need salvation? For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. In other words, salvation. We need salvation to escape eternal damnation or eternal death. 
Step three, or question three, on the Romans road. How does God provide salvation? It's found in Romans chapter five, verse eight. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Let's read this one again. Romans chapter five, verse eight. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Simply put, sin transgresses God's law, and it's an offense to him. You know, we've gotten away, I think, in many cases in our society, of the consequences and the gravity of sin in the eyes of God. God sees sin as an offense to him. Now, let's think about this. Think back to when you've been offended by someone else. Think back to what they did or what they said, how they acted. And ask yourself this question. If you could save their souls, would you still, would you, if you could save their souls by sacrificing your life, while they're not even thinking about you, would you do it? My friends, that's what God did for us. That's what Christ did for us. He provided salvation by a demonstration of his own love. That, my friends, is another piece of the good news of the gospel. Number four, step four on the Romans road, question four. How do, we, how do we receive salvation? That can be found in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 10, and verse 13. It reads like this. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. Verse 13 reads, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, my friends, this is important to keep it simple. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, you speak it, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, believe it, you will be saved. It's as simple as that. There's nothing spooky about this. We don't sprout wings and fly away and all of that, okay? It's as simple as declaring with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believing in our hearts that God raised him from the dead. We are saved. Step number five, question five on the Romans road. What are the results of salvation? This can be found in Romans chapter 5, verse 1, Romans chapter 8, verse 1, and Romans chapter 8, verses 38 and 39. Read like this. Verse 5. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 8 says, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And verses 38 through 39 read like this. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. My friends, this is some awesome news. This is shouting news right here. What are the results of salvation? We're justified through faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know, before we came to salvation, before we were justified through faith, before we accepted Christ as Lord and Savior, we were at war with God. 
we were, in, we were enemies of God. But because of what Jesus did at Calvary, we, have, we are now at peace with God. Verse 8 said, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. My friends, this is a rebuke, this is a rebuke to the enemy. You see, one of the things that the devil, the enemy, seeks to do is to remind us of our past and guilt trip us into thinking that we're not worthy of salvation. God doesn't love us because of who we are. And God is not just, just going to overlook all of that. We need to believe what God's word says. Verse 8, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. What Jesus did at Calvary erases all of that. God does not hold us, hold that against us. He does not condemn us. Why? Because we are in Jesus Christ. And in verse 38 and verse 39, for I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Simply put, my friends, because we're in Christ Jesus our Lord, we can never be separated from God. We have eternal life. That's shouting news right there. <laughs> so as we share the Romans road, with people that God has put in our circle of influence, the Romans road will touch on some things or bring out some things uh, from that person that does not know Christ. One of the things that will bring out is that they will actually, the Romans road as it's constructed will have the person admit that they're a sinner. Secondly, they'll understand that as a sinner, they deserve death. Thirdly, they'll believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for them, was buried and resurrected to save them from sin and death, eternal death. They will repent by turning from their old life. They'll understand they'll need to repent from turning from their old life of sin to a new life in Christ. And they'll receive through faith in Jesus Christ God's free gift of salvation. My friends, this, the free gift of salvation cost God so much, but was free for us. What an expression of love. Just understanding that very fact should let us know that we serve a God that loves us immensely and desires and promises that we will never be separated from him. So when we stand at death's door, when we're about to make a transition, know that in Christ, through Christ, we pass on to Abraham's bosom, to paradise, to be with the Lord, as Paul said, absent from the body, present with the Lord. And that's shouting news right there too. For every loved one that has passed on in Christ, they are rejoicing in the presence of the Lord. And if we're in Christ, we will see them again one day. And oh, my friends, my brothers and sisters, what a party that's going to be. <laughs> So I know uh, I've walked through the Romans road and I've given us some tools to uh, use in our witnessing to people that God has placed in our, in our circle of influence, who God has ordered our steps to come into contact with. It's not unusual to feel scared or nervous or vulnerable. I remember when I shared the story earlier 
about one of my first witnessing experiences. I was scared. I was nervous. I was vulnerable. I was all of that. So I didn't know how people were going to react to me. But you know, God gave us the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit will move as we engage, as we battle against the kingdom of darkness, as we engage and introduce folk to Jesus Christ and walk them through the plan of salvation. So for next steps, what can you do? I would ask that you consider reviewing the Romans road. Walk through the scriptures, internalize them, practice them. Number two, consider tying your testimony or testimonies to the Romans road. Remember, you have a story to tell. And guess what? Your story is your story. No one can argue with that. No one can argue with your story, your testimony. It's copyrighted for you and you alone. And the best person to tell it is who? You. Consider praying. Number three, consider praying and asking the Lord of the people he has placed in your life, in and around your life. Is there anyone that he wants you to witness to? As I've taught tonight, as we've engaged tonight, there may have been someone that the Lord has placed on your heart, someone's face that popped into your mind. Don't dismiss that. God is at work. He may just be prompting you. The Holy Spirit may just be prompting you to reach out to this person, to engage them, to walk them through the Romans road. Because remember, God saved us. And through us, he desires to save someone else. Don't take it lightly. So my friends, we're at the end of our time. Remember, God loves you. Remember, he has given us the Holy Spirit. Remember, he has placed people in our circle of influence. And remember, he has placed us there to reach them. God hasn't given us the spirit of fear. He's given us the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. God, we thank you. We bless you and we praise you. We thank you, Lord God, for your love. A love that demonstrated that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God, give us the boldness. Give us the faith in you and trust to reach out to those who do not know you who you've placed in our circle of influence to share the gospel, the good news of the gospel with them. And God, we pray that they will respond to your word, that their hearts will not be hard and they'll receive salvation and enter and guarantee eternal life. Have your will, have your way in our lives as we seek to do your business as we seek to upbuild the kingdom for your glory and your honor. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. My friends, it's been a pleasure. I hope that you have a very blessed rest of the week. And remember, let's stay kingdom focused. Good night.